sorry to have bothered you. <laughs> When I called a cell, it just went straight to voicemail. So I called. That's what I was afraid of. No. And then the emergency one, the guy was like, well, no problem. I'm not going to see you later. I said, well, no, somebody should go down and unlock it. It's always good to unlock it an hour early. Yeah. But I think, oh, well, he came down. Yeah. So, I, see, the reason I called you, I did find his number then, but I was afraid of that. I was afraid of going to voicemail and get it. But if he saw your name, yeah. It was one of those that went really, really fast, so I don't know if they had it turned why it didn't get it over. Yeah, okay. Is it working now? Larry Clinton? Um, Larry's here. Oh. He's talking to Jason and Nikki's got some. Alright. He's trying to do it. Did he talk to you about that? Did Larry talk to you? Briefly mentioned it. Yeah, I did. Good, how are you? Good. That sounds like you've got your part today. You said that. I just think it's a PDF. What's up, Larry? Are you the back okay? Yeah, how are you guys? Jesus, guys, thank you much. I know. You're up, Mr. Mayor. Jason, is it 5.30? I think it is. Okay, uh, we'll call the meeting to order a work session for June 19, 2023. Uh, first item on the agenda is the minutes. I don't know if people uh, got a chance to look at those. I did. So if anybody has changes, they can mention it or bring it up next week. Uh, old business and ordinance amending section 281 sewer connections required of the code of ordinances ordinances of the city of Bella Vista to require a sanitary sewer connection when service becomes available in front of or on the side or rear of a house or adjoining lot and for other purposes of course this applies uh, same as before when the house was sold and uh, there was an amendment by Mr. Fowler that was adopted uh, last week. It's on third reading this week, this month, I should say. And uh, the change in Mr. Fowler's amendment was in the wording to, to uh, take away the part about the feet, but it does apply for a side or, or rear of the house. Is there? Any discussion or any questions about Anybody it? Anybody from community development bother to ask how many new sewer lines, not improvements, new sewer lines have been put up in the last 12 to 18 months? I have not asked that. I have not heard that. Can you, Taylor? No. I uh, have spoken to Frank Knight about it, and he said they're running at a level of adding 150 to 200 per year. New sewer connections or new sewer lines? New sewer connections. Yeah. But no new lines that you're aware of? No, they have plans for uh, a new line. Well, they're digging lines right now over up around Hempstead somewhere. I don't know how what the length of them is, but they are digging on that side of town, on the east side. What? Adding, you asked about, or she said How many new lines they have put in on their own? In yes. The last 12 to 18 months, not upgrades, not connections, just brand new sewer lines. I don't know how many. I know they're digging, but I don't know how many. I don't know how many lots that is. Yeah, I, I'm not worried about what we've already got. But, you know, if we're going to try to get more, they're the ones who are going to have to do it. They do do have plans for more. 
Yeah. Well, well I, 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 I asked how many there were. Yeah. And nobody seems to know. That was my question. Yeah. How many new lines? Their latest. Eight months or so. Their latest plan is to add a brand new line they call Hatcher Finger Hope, which would go up uh, Cooper Road. And uh, Doug, I don't know if you, I'm not sure what the timing is on that. Uh, 2020, 2024, they plan on starting sometime on the, on the west side. Yeah. Um, I can tell you right now that the total capacity of what they have is about 5,450 homes. Yeah, that's a total capacity. Again, that's not what I'm asking, but yeah, you know, I understand what you're saying. If they're going to catch your finger, hope they're going to pick up a whole bunch of houses because there's one solid three sets of streets, four or five sets of streets, and they're all old. Yeah, they, that's why, why he's targeting uh, that area of town because that's, he said that's where a majority of the steel tanks are. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Um, the next item is an ordinance providing for the in the inapplicability of occupancy limits in short-term rentals for up to five reservations or lease arrangements made on or before December 19, 2022, declaring an emergency and for other purposes. Uh, did you want to address this, Wendy? Um, absolutely. So I brought this forward I, because during the discussions, from what I heard in public meetings between like May and December of last year, I don't remember, and I'm sure it was discussed, about um, previous bookings, but I don't remember being discussed. And so I thought maybe we could talk about it, see if it's an option for us. I think that for these STR owners who have done a good faith effort, who have lowered their occupancy limits and rates, that could be a, a, a good faith thing for us to do. We say, hey, five of your previous bookings before this ordinance even existed could be um, honored or up to, yeah, up to five. I had a question. Does that mean five total or five per owner? Five per property. So oh. if, they, if they own four, four properties in the area, then per, per property, individual, yeah. I don't have a problem with that at all. I, I, I guess my feeling is is that with the with the views expressed by the property owners uh, that were most adamant against doing the ordinance, it would have been, I guess, my presumption that if they were concerned about being able to serve anyone after the effective date, that they would have brought forward after we adopted it in December or shortly afterwards a concern about being able to book parties that they already had on the books. And, and so uh, there were two owners that contacted me in the last couple of weeks. One was a, by email and one was a, by telephone. Uh, one was a family reunion in Bella Vista and they had uh, the, the big place on Loch Lomond, the other one I'm not sure exactly where it was, but it was on one of the lakes, uh, Evergreen something or Evergreen other. Shores. Evergreen Shores, I guess was the name of it. And he was in a panic. It was a young couple. Uh, they were they were uh, um, about to be married, and they wanted to do a family, I think, reception at the, at this location. And if they couldn't do that, uh, they just got notice. Um, and I explained to him that after the ordinance was adopted, it was not something new and unknown that we did in the, in the late at night with no one else around, that the, the discussion had been ongoing for most of all of 22, starting certainly in March, but we had lots of press, we had lots of discussion, um, and, and personally I had lots of discussion with property the the str property owners that i felt in my opinion as a counselor that it was their responsibility to communicate to the leasing organization whether it was a ar uh, airbnb or uh, ar or vrbo or whoever it was or whether they did it themselves they needed to notify them that after this date they would not be able to accommodate whatever they were allowing to accommodate before. 
but none of those owners brought anything to us with that concern. We could have done the exact same thing. We could have taken care of that, but we didn't. We ignored that too. That's well, a two-way street. I don't street. know that we ignored it. I well, it didn't come up, right? So it obviously, we, if, if, if they ignored it and we didn't do anything, then you know both of us are a little bit at fault here. And I don't have a problem at all with you know five, and it's not going to take that long to get through the five and just take care of it, and then it's over and done. But you know, if they didn't bring it up, you know, too bad on them. But we should have brought it up too. That you know, as of right now, all bets are off. And we didn't do that either. Well, and even after, and we had a whole year, just like you said. Yeah, but even after it was adopted, they they didn't apparently bother to talk to their booking groups and let them know that there's the problem. And we didn't either. So so what? She's only asking for five, not asking for a hundred. Because I'm sure there's a whole lot more than five that are going to get done. Can I can I say something? Well, that's loud. I'm going to give my annual advice to you. Work sessions are not for debate. Work sessions are for gathering information you may need in order to have your debate next week. So I, 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 I'll just leave it there. You all know what I'm saying. And, uh, but uh, gathering information is what we need to do here. And, and we don't have minutes of this meeting, even though it's recorded. So I always want to make sure we have a good, clear record of what everyone said and why they said it. And, and, and that's important, and particularly on this issue, as you all know. So I just would encourage you all to save your debate for next week and, and get some information uh, and answer some questions maybe of staff. That, that's, that's what's good for work well, session. I guess, I guess my question, Wendy, do you, do you have any particular knowledge about how many of this might be affecting? I don't. I, th I was, this was brought to my attention by an STR owner in the middle of May. Um, they, at that point, they found out what their final occupancy was going to be from their permitting process. And so that was where their panic was kind of at. Um, I know that for some of them, I might have been a little delayed because of the wording hiccup we had with the septic issue that we got corrected in March or late in, in, into March. And so I think that delayed some of the homeowners from being able to be as proactive as they would have chosen to be. Um, Just informational. What? You want to say something? I was just going to, I haven't been asked, but I think as your prosecutor and someone who's going to be enforcing this, I wanted to point out a question I have about it that I have not figured out yet. And I know that Chief Graves is back there and he's going to be handling the code enforcement officers here beginning next week. Um, I don't, we, we need to be able to know how we're going to find out when a reservation was made in order to know that when we get the call at midnight on Saturday morning that there are too many people in this house that they are one of the five exceptions that of a, of a reservation that was made before December 15th, 19th of 2022. So those are, that's just a practical thing that's gonna come up we need to think about. And I think Taylor and I, Taylor mentioned there might be a way to flag this in the system where they pop up um, so the homeowner would have to provide documentation that's time stamp saying, and which they, they, they're able to pull a report saying when it's done. And I think Taylor said there's a possibility that they can, so that they verify it, they can put the pop up in there. Well, there's nothing in the draft that requires them to register their five with us. Okay. So just something to think about. Uh, uh, and then. I guess the other question would be, and I guess that would be resolved in, in the answer to your first question, but how do we know which, they get five exceptions, but let's say they made 10 reservations before the deadline. How do we know this is the sixth one versus the fourth one? Is it the order of the reservations or the order of the booking date? I think it's their choice. So if they have ones that are a higher cost weekend for them or a more profitable or a longer, longer stay opposed to the kind of fielder's choice on how I'm seeing it. Okay. I was going to ask the same thing, quite honestly. Uh, how, was, how are we going to manage it? Uh, I said it does open up a whole can of worms. Uh, secondarily, so this uh, ordinance passed December the 18th of 2022. 
Uh, if you go to the city website and click on the opening page down the right hand corner, you know, there's a uh, shortcut to the short term. Basically, it's not, it's not the rental ordinance word for word, but basically it gives you all the parameters right there. Um, I talked to Taylor today just to try to get a feel for when this page went up. Taylor, could you, could you just real quickly, you don't have to come up, but when you worked on it with Cassie, uh, about when did this page go up? on the city website. The website went live at the end of January, so that was like a 30-day notice basically for when we start taking applications. So around January 30th, give or take. Right. So this notice has been up there a long time. <laughs> and we determined the occupancy with the uh, ordinance. So I mean that's been decided since since December. Just informational, just putting that out there. This is this has been out in the public for a long time. And uh, there's been a lot. There's been a lot of time to make arrangements during that time. Uh, well, I, this is just informational. I, it's my perception that uh, a lot of the SDR owners didn't do much because they thought the state would overrule it, or the lawsuit would be successful, and it would never happen. I, I, I don't know which way that cuts. I, I do think this makes something that's a challenge to enforce virtually impossible to enforce this amendment, but, but I wouldn't want to debate when you're not supposed to, so. Question, what difference does it really make? I mean, why do we, have, why are we making this so complicated? So somebody, an STR owner has a, someone in their property it's either there's too many or then somebody's going to go by and check it and if there's not too many i mean really what difference does it make is it that really important that we enforce that particular i, I would uh larry I, I would think that we we're not the occupancy police nor is our code enforcement department the occupancy police. It would seem to me that if we got a complaint for parking or some other, some other reason to causing code enforcement or the police department to go to that particular rental unit, we would not know that they were renting more or housing more people than is, is permitted by our code. I mean, does that say we're asking them or telling them they can break the law? No, because if there's a complaint, they're going to get whacked. And if nobody complains, we know nothing about it? We don't. Okay, uh, we, uh, thanks for your comments. We better uh, move along. Next one is uh, C, amending section 10942 variances of the code of ordinance of the city of bella vista to permit administrative review and approval of the increase in size of permanent signs up to 10 percent and for other purposes and this proposal was uh, put forward by myself after uh, input from uh, cds and you guys all remember the case where it very recently, uh, the sign was supposed to be 25 square feet, and it was 25.4 square feet, because that was the standard size. And so it went through the planning commission, it went through us, and it was a big rigmarole. And the CDS folks pointed out to me, in most other areas of the code, they have a little bit of discretion, a little bit of wiggle room, and the sign ordinance was just very exact. So that's why we had to spend all that time in the planning commission and city council. So that's the reason for those proposals, just to give them a little uh, discretion in the sign ordinance like they have in other places. Larry. I, I guess I was extremely disappointed in the uh, behavior of our planning commissioners wearing the hat of the Board of Zoning Adjustment at that, at that particular juncture. They failed to follow through with the findings of the required by the variance proceedings, in which case it would have been turned down and this would have been on our desk last month or a month before this. 
this is a, a catch-up fix, and we now have um, an illustration by our Zorda Boning at, Board of Zoning Adjustment that they'll pass anything, even if the only reason for it is hardship. They'll give you a variance, and it's and it happened on two occasions. I believe this is one of them, and I think one after this. That was the only the only cause for granting the variance was hardship. The only reason for not granting it was hardship, and so, and it was not a true hardship based upon the definition of that. So I was greatly disappointed with the with the processing by our planning commission um, not doing their doing their fulfilling their responsibilities. I wouldn't say doing their job, fulfilling their responsibilities. There were several who voted against approval. And it would have brought this ordinance to our desk one or two months ago. So that's my, my views. So how do you feel about the ordinance? <coughs> what? So how do you feel about the ordinance? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm in support of it. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, it, it, it provides some latitude for the for the planning department. And the reality is, is I don't know if all of the sign companies have a digital sign that's at the fraction of a foot greater than what our standards are, because we have standards for different things. And and I don't know if all of them are in that category, or the, or only or only this particular one sign company. And, and maybe Arvest has with their banking. Uh, they use typically this vendor, and so instead of changing vendors who had one that was exactly or just under uh, this, the stipulation in the code is not practical sometimes in a business relationship. So to ask them to change vendors if that's the case, I don't know if all of the vendors have that fraction of a foot more. I don't know. Certainly they could have, they could have proceeded by going with the next smaller sign because that would not have made it uh, a, a uh... Are you trying to say that the sign company only makes one size sign when you go to ask them to make a sign or when you want a sign you tell them what you want? They have standards. They, should, they all have standards but they can make it any size, any size you want. So it isn't like they only make 24 and a half footers. Well, I don't know. They and this is for information. Twenty-four and a half footers, but they filed twenty-five point four. They'll make it any size you want. So. Well, but they filed for a variance because that was their standard, as they explained at it to the meeting. At the time, and now they want a little slack. I don't have a problem with that. They're not asking for the world. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that they are. I'm but, saying, but you're making it sound like they only make one size sign, and if you can't put it in there, you can't have it. Well, they make a smaller one that was not self-imposed hardship. Maybe they don't want the smaller one. Maybe I understand. the company wants the bigger one. And my point being is that we should have had this ordinance rather than the uh, And you're going to vote for it anyhow, so let's go, John. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're right. Ordinance D, I have to apologize to Mr. Judson because I just realized I was going to do this one first. Uh, this is amending section 109-185 docks, boathouses, and dockside recreational improvements of the code of ordinances of the city of Bella Vista to remove the city imposed restriction on the number of docks, boathouses, or dockside recreational improvements allowed per parcel and for other purposes. And the point of this is uh, this has come before the Planning Commission a number of times. People kept asking for variances because it turns out in, in the condominiums, there's one big gigantic parcel. So that would mean you could only have one boat dock. And so people would come and ask for exceptions and then uh, uh, the Planning Commission feels very strongly that this is kind of a POA thing anyway and uh, I think Tom was going to say a few words explaining uh, what's happening with the POA and whatnot in regard to Botox. That's what he said. So we have a, joint, a joint meeting between the Planning Commission, uh, the city, the ACC, and the Town Association, so we could all work together. Um, we developed 
uh, a revised a POA policy, is, is policy 3.09, uh, which goes into great detail on how to handle this situation. Uh, what I was particularly happy or pleased with is how all four of the organizations work jointly together to develop this uh, modification to the policy. All were in agreement on uh, how to uh, go forth and, and make this easier on uh, our residents uh, and more efficient uh, and hopefully clearer on uh, how to, uh, what applies and so forth. Especially, uh, Mayor referenced uh, the Townhouse Association where it's one parcel, uh, a lot of limited common property along the, the water line and how do we administer that and so forth. Uh, if you'd like to take a view of what policy 3.09 is, it's available on the POA's website uh, under policies under consideration. Uh, take a look at that. If you have any questions, you can contact me. Uh, the board has already voted once on this. Uh, the POA board of directors have voted once. They'll vote again next Thursday, and then we'll go into effect. Uh, so we tried to do that so we, uh, the POA policy would go into effect just before the city made their change so that there would be no lapse in coverage, if you want to call it that. Any questions? So if you have a large lot on the lake, uh, what is the size that you need to put in two docks or three docks? Uh, is, there a, is there a limitation? Can you put in two docks or three you know, docks? The exception we grant was for the Townhouse Association, which has a very large stretch of limited common property. Yeah. Other than that, uh, a property owner is limited to one dock per home, per parcel. Per parcel. Sorry about that. Okay. So, so you, do have, you do have some standards in there for? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and, the, uh, and the dock can be no more than 50% of the shoreline. And we have a description of how the shoreline is measured and so forth. So there's, there could be someone that has a very large amount of front seawall or a property line that's fronting. Uh, we're going to limit that to 50%, which is still, they can go out 50% of the entire width. They can go out uh, 18 feet, and that's, that's a pretty big dock. So that should accommodate even the, the largest of them. Is this... Uh was brought about for, in regard to a particular situation? Uh, from what I understand, the uh, Planning Commission was getting a lot of requests for uh, variances, and they took a step back, and I, I don't want to speak for someone, but they took a step back and realized that they were actually regulating something that they shouldn't be regulating. Uh, because it's common property, which is the lakes, keep in mind, lakes are on POA common property. Uh, even though a dock is built on common property and, and the owner retains the rights to the dock, they do not retain the rights to, this, to the bed of the lake that the dock is connected to. Uh, so they may own the shoreline, they own, may own the dock, but they don't own uh, the bed of the, of, the, of the lake. So a little bit of a interesting legal situation there. So that, that leads me to two more questions. One at a time. My memory certainly. Relative to the to the dock being on land that the POA is in charge of, if they have a floating dock out on the end, and there are places where I've seen those, they're still going to own that. So they own. If you build that dock, or you sell the home. So even if it's floating out there off the shoreline, then that you still would take jurisdiction. The, the second part of that would be um, uh, is the um, status of our lakes under any of the Arkansas Fish and Wildlife? All of our lakes are, are privately owned lakes, uh, have privately controlled. There are some regulations that do carry down from the state. But uh, not relative to this <laughs> matter. To okay. this. What we're trying to be also conscious of is we don't want to overload the lakes yeah. with too many, too many docks and too many uh, boats and so forth. So we want to try and be, you know, because we have a limited resource, we don't want to uh, have uh, an unsafe uh, conditions on the 4th of July or something of that nature. So we want to make sure we 
have reasonable number of vessels on our lakes and a reasonable number of docks. And we feel that how we've written this uh, policy will accomplish that. Anything else? Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you Tom. Appreciate it. The next one is a resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to enter into a three-year lease contract with Stronghold Data LLC in an amount not to exceed $32,540.61 for the lease of Dell computers and associated equipment. Uh, John Mokel, uh, could you come up and address this for a minute? off the directory off so the data is still there is that true uh, we always take it a step further than that uh, we have a program that uses a department of defense algorithm to do what they call zeroing the hard drive so it writes over every sector of hard drive multiple times uh, before it's disposed of so 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 you actually pretty well remove the yeah any information that might be on there that otherwise uh, yeah, yeah we can guarantee uh, sure. every bit has been overwritten, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. The city of Denver just had a problem. Any indication that there was any attempt to access our system? No, not that I'm aware of. I mean, it, would you know if, if something on the outside tried to get into our system, would you know that? Yes, um, yeah, last year we bought a comprehensive cybersecurity package um, that includes um, what they call SEAM and SOC, which basically is a security operations center. So there, there is a group out in Colorado who are monitoring our network and 24 seven and they can alert us if they find any incidents, yes. Right. Anything else? Right, thank you. Okay, next one is Thank you, John. Next one is resolution approving a code enforcement officer policy for the police department. And this has to do, of course, with the transfer of uh, three code enforcement folks starting uh, June 26. So uh, the chief uh, proposed a policy having to do with that. Any questions or comments? Okay, next one is G, resolution approving an organizational chart for inclusion in the policy for the police department. And uh, that reflected, uh, I don't know, Chief, was there any changes besides the code enforcement officers? There were a couple, and I thought this was a good time to memorialize and update the, the, the flow chart. So there was a new lieutenant added a little while back another division for growth within the agency so um, uh, it, it was just it wasn't adding additional personnel just restructuring the way that the, the department flowed so okay. I, thought this, I thought with the addition of the code enforcement officers would be a good time just to update it and put it back in the policy area. okay did we already do this one uh yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the code enforcement policy. That was number F. Okay, yeah. so I, I have a question about that. But. Oh, go ahead. Um, Larry has a question about F. 
Yeah, I wasn't sure which one fit in here. Um, maybe my stupidity. Uh, down at the bottom, it talks about objectives. And objective number two is to provide resolution of cases at the lowest possible administrative staff level to maximize the efficiency and to minimize conflict among residents, property, and business owners in the city. Uh, and, and my question really is, among residents, is that is that the public at large, uh, or is that only people who live here, or only people who are presently residing, let's say, at an STR location? So in other words, they're a non-resident, but while they're here, they are a resident. So how does that definition, is that restrictive in any way, legally? Well, no, I mean, it, it would be anybody who would be subjected to our code enforcement policy. So if it's somebody in the STR, they would obviously be subjected to our code enforcement policy. And my only question was, is the way it's worded, is it among residents, does that include the public at large, non-residential people staying here, uh, is that inclusive of those folks too? Well, just like, well, yes, it would be. Just like anybody who drives through Bella Vista and, and violates one of our codes, ordinances, a, a law, and we have jurisdiction over them to enforce that policy or, or ordinance or law, then we could do that either law enforcement side of the equation or code enforcement side of the equation. Okay, so we're, we're, we're covering that. Okay, um, the next one. You know, I do apologize. Oh, uh, uh, Chief, I'm sorry. I did have, I had a question from a resident today. So in the case of short-term rentals, uh, on a weekend, uh, you know, you have something going on, right? Would uh, the resident call code enforcement or would they call the police? I guess, I guess the police department, right? Yeah, so or parking, for instance. Sure, so, so just like we handle currently our officers Commission officers do uh, enforce code enforcement policy, code, codes within the city of Okay, So just like with code enforcement, we're putting all the reporting under the police department umbrella so they would call the non-emergency number like they would currently do. Okay. It'll, be, it'll be run through dispatch. It'll be dispatched like that. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah, I think that's one of the advantages of this uh, system is that Everything's running through dispatch and, you know, being uh, memorialized and whatnot, so. Okay, uh, let's see, next one is discussion items. Amending the unsightly conditions code to promote monarch and pollinator gardens and planning director Taylor Robertson. Um, so I brought a little packet for everyone today. You have a stapled National Wildlife Federation model ordinance guide. And then you have a, another little packet of miscellaneous information provided by me. Um, so the mayor renewed our monarch, our mayor's monarch pledge this year. And one of the items that the city pledged to do was to adapt our weeds, um, unsightly section of code to allow for monarch or pollinator gardens. So they have basically, the idea is to increase the amount of food that they have within city limits. Whereas right now a clean cut lawn, there's nothing for them to eat in that. They need a pollinator, they need milkweed is the number one item. Um, in your packet, you have the, I wanted to provide pictures to show you when we say like weeds or pollinators, we're not talking about grass that grows up the side of the house. We're talking about items that have pretty looking, like, you know, they're, they're flowers, they provide nectar, these aren't just green weeds that grow up um, randomly throughout the yard. Milkweed is the number one provider um, for monarchs and their caterpillars, but they do provide food also throughout all stages of life. Um, it is their number one, it is the best pollinator, but there are other um, native plants that I've provided in your packet um, that also serve as great pollinators or food sources for the monarch and other pollinator species. Essentially, with the current code that we have now in our unsightly area, it cuts the limitation to 10 inches, so you can't have any grass, whether it's pretty or not, um, be taller than 10 inches. The problem is that normally the pollinator species are much taller than 10 inches. 
They're normally around two feet, three feet, some are even to four feet. So we don't have any ordinance or allowance basically for these providers, these providing native species to reach full bloom, which then of course provides the nectar and the food for um, monarchs. And the whole point of the mayor's monarch program is to help combat the 99% decline we've had in monarchs um, here recently. So um, being a monarch city, we are also, which is separate from the monarchs or the mayor's monarchs pledge, you'll see the sticker on one of our signs. Uh, we need to provide and increase the amount of monarchs that are here in city limits and by doing that um, I've provided um, a general proposal to you guys today to pick your brains um, on basically exempting pollinators or milkweeds. I have provided all kinds of examples in there from the definition of weeds so that way they're not included in the 10 inch um, requirement. So if we exempt these species from that by doing so, which is also in your model ordinance guide. There's three options in here that the National Wildlife Federation um, basically suggests for the Mayor Marnical Pledge, um, and one of the options that we chose to hear before you today, which is basically exempting pollinator species from the weeds unsightly section of code. With that said, I also wanted to note this also comes to the support from some of our, uh, most of our actually tree um, advisory board members. Um, they all selected that they like this option better um, out of the ones that I offered. And so here I am with you today, bringing it forward for an open discussion item. Happy to take any questions. So I've been trying to start a pollinator garden, so this means you'll come take care of it for me? <laughs> That's precisely what it means. <laughs> <laughs> I will come take pictures of it, though. I would love to use that as an example. So, so, so does this have to be designed like specifically as a pollinator garden, you know what I mean? So the idea is yes, they have to be pollinator plant species that blooms and all of that to be exempt from the weed definition. So, and I understand that, oh. but I guess where I was going with it, and you know what, I'm all for it, I think it's great, I love butterflies, everybody does. Uh, but what if it's just a, it's weeds and pollinator plants, you know, and it's unsightly, you know what I mean? How do you... That's why my question is, is it supposed to be an area that's specifically designated as like pollinator plant area? And that's, that's open for the table um, tonight. Like, uh, there are some model ordinances in here that kind of like the city, there are some cities in here that they use as models, straight up define what the city wants to see, whether it's a defined area with a border and the pollinators in it or whether it's the whole backyard. Um, that is another option in here, to also open here. We can design a, um, a plan like another city did. I think it's the first option um, in your, mo your model ordinance guide, if you want to take a peek at that. But this right here, the exemption route, was the easiest one that we went through, just to exempt them and let them grow. Basically, to kind of prohibit the mowing that ruins the pollinator areas. Yeah. Yeah. Suppose... Uh, and I haven't had a chance to read the proposed ordinances, but suppose someone takes their entire front yard <laughs> and plants wildflowers there. Is, it, is that okay? That's what I'm asking you guys tonight. Is that what you're wanting to see, or would you rather <laughs> see a... Yeah, right yeah. now it's not. Yeah. yeah. I, I have lived in places that are... Uh, expensive and quite fancy where that was done and litigation ensued and the person with the wildfires won. So that was quite a while ago actually. Twenty, thirty years maybe. grass is 10 inches or higher, or higher than 10 inches, then they've got to cut it. If we have an exception for these various species, we don't necessarily have a full view of the entire yard to know that these species may be located within this tall grass. And how we're going to have to train our enforcement officers to be able to recognize these various species of, of plant to know whether or not they can be more than 10 inches high because most people's lawns are lawns and weeds together. You know, it's not, especially if they've been let go. So I can see from an enforcement, even with the exception, 
how, how do we do that without letting it all go? I don't know how to do that. Yeah. That's why I say, I mean, I don't know, we can, you know, have, a person could designate an area of their yard for this, right? Because I was just seeing an opportunity where I never have to mow my front yard again, and that's great, you know. But I'm just teasing, but I'm just saying, just to Jason's point, I mean, you could see code enforcement going by a yard and said, hey, you know, you got to you go, oh, that's a pollinator uh, yard, right? You know what I mean? And it could just be a mishmash of a whole bunch of stuff. It is pretty evident what's grass and what's a pollinator. Plant. Or weeds. Now, add to that, though this Architectural Control Committee will not have the same rule as you have, and they will end up sending them a letter and making them mow it down. The committee is so keep that in team. mind as well. Uh, if okay. it's in the DOA. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, one thing I noticed came up at the tree board meeting. I thought was interesting was they were talking about the mowing on the side of the roadway and that some places in the roadway had quite a few pollinators and it would be good to let those go and not mow them and I think that's fine I think it's a good solution I am quite confident there'll be some citizens call up and say hey you're not mowing by the roadway well enough well enough when you leave certain areas go because they have pollinators in them but but it could be a good way to uh to encourage the wildlife question question for you the list of the top 15 top a top 15 list of native arkansas plants for pollinators there are more than the 15 this is just the top bunch there's like i think over 50 um that this document specifically that I pulled from will go into um, there's a link on there but yeah they just pulled the top 15 from that giant list there's much more so um, the, there's there's a, a, a classification I guess they call it wildflowers is that a part of this group of pollinators and I and I and I liken that because if you drive Hudson uh, Highway what is it 102 East uh, into uh, into Bentonville then into Rogers and on the north side of the street there um, by the uh, retirement home, two retirement homes, they burn that area off and that's a, a native site that they have reestablished into its native. They call that Searless Prairie and I guess it's like that because that's what this place used to look like way back when. But they, but, but it's it's largely wildflowers when it grows in the I've never seen that many wildflowers in it. Well, it's just I'm, like yeah, but they it's burn just it. just like a field somewhere. They burn it off, and I've and seen they burn them. it off so it continues to grow. Yeah. So, so does the group include traditional wildflowers as we know them? And there, there are some that areas along the highway in Arkansas that they say this is a wildflower area to be drive on 40 towards Little Rock, there's a section in there that said this is a wildflower area. And I've seen that in other states too. I mean, I think it's just the discussion or like what types of, what types of flowers. I didn't want to say just wildflowers because you could have some that are invasive, um, you know, and end up causing ramifications if they're type, that type of wildflower. So that's why I focus specifically on the native species and of course the monarch number one food, milkweed, but um, just with the proposal here for just discussion, I just brought forward native instead of just sticking a wildflower, but yes, these are wildflowers. But just wanting to be making sure that we're being conscious of making sure it's a native wildflower. So there are more than this, you said there are about 50 total plus, plus the milkweed? Uh, I think milkweed's included um, in that, but yeah, I think there's close to 50 other species um, that the native heritage um, mentions for the Arkansas natives. So our ordinance for this then would include all of those? Well, my very, very, very generic uh, proposal here does say and other native plants that provide a substantial food source for modern butterflies and their caterpillars. Um, but yeah, again, this is kind of just wanting to bring this on the table. Um, there's a lot of different model ordinances in here. Like there's ones that get much, a lot more specific with the defined borders or even like native landscaping, like things they have to follow in order for it to be allowed. We could go that route or we could go the simple route and just exclude them. I'm just here to discuss it with you today. So. I 
was wondering if you, if it's not too much effort, if you could shoot us all a, a summary or a list or whatever of what the ACC rule is, and then you know we could kind of, because I think Jason made a good point. I, I, I suspect there's a way to work around that. You could have an area of wildflowers and probably not run afoul of that. Okay. So, yeah. anyway, it'd be helpful to look at it when we're considering all this. I'll get that down for you. Anything else? Okay, uh, that's the end of the discussion items, unless somebody has something else they need to bring up. We can go ahead and uh, adjourn. Thank you very much.